Well, I've been off YouTube now for a couple of weeks because I was given a bit of a gypsy's warning by one of the New Zealand police arms officers that he wasn't happy about me showing my face and my firearms collection. I've done some checking. It's not actually forbidden, but it's not recommended. I've had uh, a long chat with a good mate of mine. He's a pretty senior cop. And he says, oh, look, the hell with it. It's just somebody getting overexcited. You should ignore it. Other people, on the other hand, have said, well, technically, as a collector, you're supposed to remain discreet. And therefore, it's probably not a good idea to do the YouTube thing, showing yourself and your firearms. So we're going to work our way around this problem. We've come up with, uh, with a plan B. Now, firstly, what I'm going to show you now is just a couple of items that I've acquired in the last few weeks. I'm moving into some of the high-end militaria. Stuff I've had my eye on for a while, but you know, price-wise it's expensive, therefore I've kind of shied away from it. I think it's sensible at this point to start investing some money in militaria rather than small arms, rather than firearms, simply because I'm very concerned about the implications of next year's United Nations Small Arms Reduction Treaty. If it's ratified, I think it's going to give a tremendous amount of elbow room to the ban the gun people here to say that New Zealand should and must be compliant with a with a international treaty. So it's really we're into the realms of the unknown. So I'm going to show you a few of the military items that I've acquired in the last few weeks. I'm going to talk about the upcoming US trip and just, just give you a ticky tour and show you some of the things that I've that I've acquired in the last little while. Of course because of the restrictions um, imposed or the guidelines imposed I can't show you any of these firearms so if you're looking at them now um, it's probably causing you heart attacks you better turn your head immediately because these things clearly constitute a threat to national security this in spite of the fact that this is a steel lined room with a very comprehensive alarm system steel uh, lined bars in the interior including an electrified grid all the firearms in here are, as per the New Zealand requirements and law, they have components of the mechanism removed, that is to say firing pins and extractors, things of that nature, to make them inactive in the event that somebody was successful in getting in here and taking the items. Even in spite of all those things, an alarm system that's direct wired to the police station, despite all that, I'm not allowed to show you my firearms collection, so look away, we won't talk about those things. What we'll talk about is some of the military things. Now this, this is something that you can get off eBay. There's a guy in America who's doing nose art. It's an aluminium piece that he's fashioned and it's, it's, this one's obviously from a kitty hawk, but there's a whole lot of others. I think they're very, very reasonably priced and it just adds a bit of a splash of color to the room. So that arrived and I've hung it up, which explains why there's ladders and bits of crap all over the place. Something else um, which I picked up out of the United States You'll find there's a lot of um, military art suppliers uh, on the internet and I saw this picture when I was in Normandy. It's by a guy called Richard Taylor and it's called Closing the Gap. It's a typhoon strike in the Falaise Gap and I just fell in love with it so I managed to get a, uh, a print out of the US and just had it framed up and I think it, it really adds to uh, the overall theme as far as the, uh, the artwork that's around. So that's one of the things. When I talk about high-end military, the items that I've had my eye on for a long time, but they've been price prohibitive, or I've kind of shied away and think, well, you know, next year I'll get it. Prices are climbing all the time, so I've decided to bite the bullet and grab items that I've been looking at but haven't committed to, uh, and just issue some of the firearms purchases. This is a genuine Luftwaffe German um, Fallschirmjäger helmet with an interesting liner too. It's a proper... 1945, sorry, 1943 dated camouflage cover, and on top of that is a German ceremonial dagger. We'll have a look at these things in detail at some point. The other sort of stuff I've been picking up is some of the some of the you know the German medallions and medals. That's as a a mother's cross in gold, and around the back there's a 1939 war merit cross. So these sort of things that just add to you know the badges and. Um, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I've got an Iron Cross second class around here. Some, somewhere I'll get an Iron Cross first class some stage in the not too distant future. The other kinds of things, they're bits and pieces, but they're bloody interesting. Um, 
they're genuine uh, period uh, first aid kits. Uh, this is Bronze Star, they have a V clasp for Valor. There are a couple of iodine swabs and uh, burn ointment. All the stuff that you'd find in a, in a conventional sort of medical kit. In addition to that, I managed to find a genuine, this brown bit of paper coming around now, is a genuine individual chemical prophylactic pack. Anti-venereal disease. I'll pull that out and show it to you. It's fascinating. It's a tube of ointment, a little wiping cloth and instructions on how to uh, treat yourself after exposure to some dirty girl that may be giving you galloping knob rot. So we'll have a look at that in the not too distant future. Uniform items. Um, I had a, a replica jacket. Now this one is the original. This is a proper, uh, probably 1944 manufacture Buff and SS camouflage schmock. The combat tunic that you see underneath is a replica, but I have a real, um, a, you know, an original Totten Kopf proper combat uniform coming from Italy of all places. So that should be here before too long. So I'm starting to invest in those high end uniform items. Also got some British airborne stuff um, arriving over the next little while. So I'm biting the bullet and buying that sort of thing. I think it's a safer investment. It's not uh, depreciating in price at all. Um, and it's more easily liquidatable than the evil machine guns, which I'm allowed to show you, so we'll stop looking at those. Some other bits and pieces. You know, I've, I've, I've been a little bit negligent of the Italians. And uh, I'll just open this up for you. A friend of mine who specializes in, in, in collecting Vietnam era stuff, he's got a lot of World War II stuff that he started collecting 30 years ago as a kid. And he gave me this um, Aprila. It's a black shirt regiment, the 5th, 5th Legion Aprilia um, out of Italy. It's a trumpet banner that they used for their battalion. Aprilia is an area, if you're familiar with the Anzio campaign, you'll know that that was a, one of the little towns that was fought over. A really nasty fight. The Americans lost huge numbers of people. And if you've heard of Derby's Rangers, that was a unit that was kind of three years in the making that was destroyed pretty much in one night. There's some more Soviet stuff coming. Um, I've just got a trench periscope that arrived today which is in really good nick. It's interesting we'll have a look at that and we'll look at some of the um, Soviet uniform items and equipment items. And the other things that I've been a, li a little bit negligent in acquiring are the Japanese items. So I've got a few of those things. There's a thousand stitch belt there. Um, there's a Japanese dog tag picked up of a dead body in Okinawa. There's a couple of medals. They are basically medals issued to the families of those poor unfortunates who had sacrificed their life for the Emperor. Um, fewer bits and pieces like that. And also with the Japanese, a bit of gas mask, a beautiful condition gas mask down there. A, a, a enlisted man's hat, um, complete tropical uniform. Got a lot of pistols and swords and things like that pair of binoculars but the um, the pierce to the resistance is this original World War II Japanese helmet that is not particularly significant I already have one but what is is the cover the cover is genuine it's marked and it's matched to this handkerchief uh, neck shade which is secured to the cover by three little hooks and that's also stamped and marked so that's, that's expensive and unusual, but that's sort of where I'm going now. There's an SS helmet arriving. Oh, that won't be here for a while, but that's, that's the sort of thing that I'm gravitating towards now, rather than spending money on these evil, awful machine guns that have to have bits taken out of them anyway. All the bits are secured in a safe in another area. I won't tell you where that is. Um, but even so, apparently, this constitutes a major security threat, so I'm not allowed to do it, so we won't, we won't look at the guns anymore. Now the other thing that's happening in... Uh, oh, here's one more thing. Sorry, when I'm, I'm walking and talking. I'm sorry about this, but... A couple of other things which are, are kind of exotic. This is a sticky bomb. Uh, a gammon bomb, it was called. It's a chunk of high explosive covered with a, a sticky uh, stocking held in a spherical, uh, aluminium spherical cover, you pull the pin out, um, you activate the explosive and then you run up and you slap that on the side of a tank or a structure that you want to destroy. It's just a big chunk of plastic explosive. Looks like a toffee apple but 
never seen one before found it in the UK and uh, grabbed it discharge a cup for um, the number three Enfield it goes with the Mills bomb with the discharger cup base it's there found a an unopened emergency 24-hour emergency ration pack tin with contents which is nice so there's those sorts of things they're little little bits and pieces but nonetheless they're um they're quite important uh, also there's a sniper's uh, scout telescope which I managed to find out of the UK as well one of the other things which is really quite exotic, I mean the Gammon bomb, the sticky bomb, is a pretty significant addition. And the other is this thing here. It's called a smatchet. And there's the scabbard that goes with it. It's very, very rare indeed. It looks a lot like the uh, the Medic's bolo, or Corman's bolo that the Marines were using, but it's not. It's not in combat. It's a fighting knife. And if you know who Major Fairburn is, he's the bloke that invented this thing here, the Fairburn Sykes Commander Knife. He's also the author of the Get Tough, How to Win in Hand-to-Hand -hand Fighting publication, 1943. And the Smatchet makes an appearance in that. It's very, very rare. So I was delighted to find one in the UK. And uh, I decided to, to buy the bloody thing. A few other things, there's some marching compasses. Um, what else have I got in the last few days? Parahelmet, Brit Parahelmet. There's a Denison smock on the way. Um, managed to find an Emery. My friend Emery and I were looking at this in a case in a museum in Normandy and wondering what the hell was in it. We knew it was a signals tool, but we didn't know exactly what it contained. We found one. It contains a, a pocket knife and a, a set of wire cutters. So Emery, that's what's in there. And uh, I've now got one complete to throw into the mix. Um, what else have we got, fellas? No, that's probably about it. There's a, there's a few other bits and pieces which we'll get to in time. Now, the other thing that's happening is I'm off to America in 10 days. I'm going for three weeks. I'm flying solo. My wife is going to another destination with her mother to do some shopping. I am attending, first of all, the Phoenix Gun Show, and then I'm going to up to Nevada to attend Front Sight. I have a two-day defensive pistol course followed by a two-day AR-15. I'm sorry I keep showing you these machine guns, I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, from there, I fly across to Tulsa in Oklahoma to the US Shooting Academy and I have two days one-on-one -on -one tuition in pistol and rifle. And I'll be making film about that, just having a look at how the Americans train. We know that America is an armed society by virtue of the Second Amendment, but what's not really widely appreciated is that the guys there are also very, very well trained. From what I've seen, the CQB type shooting that the civilians are doing at these schools is a hell of a lot better quality training than I received as a professional soldier. But I'm going to go and have a look and see if that is indeed the case. Then at the tail end, I go down from Tulsa to, oh, more machine guns, fuck, look away, Martha. I go down, oh, more. I go down to Texas to visit Jim, my good mate Jim, C2 builder, and we'll be firing machine guns. So. That'll be from, what is it, 30th of November through, and I'm back in New Zealand about the 22nd of December, just before Christmas. So, that's where we're going with that. The channel, the way around the censorship issue is that we're going to do, a couple of guys are going to get together and we're going to do a collaborative channel. Each of us has slightly different things to bring to the mix. So we're all going to get together, all make a, you know, make a different contribution to a video about one topic, post it, block it in the US, so that nobody in New Zealand can see these terrible firearms which I'm not allowed to show you and we're going to get around the censorship issue that way. So that's where we're going. I hope you're all well and I'll talk to you soon.